Now, was it a wonderful night last night? Yes. I think that uh, our first president, Dr. Hognes, would be quite proud that we ate very well last night. But instead of, in addition to eating well, remember he said, well, you know, we got to keep people engaged. Well, we had an outstanding speaker, and it was so powerful, so inspirational. It was a great way to start our meeting. So welcome, and good morning, members, invited guests, and friends. And those of you in this room and those joining us via the webcast, uh, I'm just welcome. I'm delighted and honored to deliver my yearly report to you as the final president of the Institute of Medicine and the very first president of the National Academy of Medicine. Now, not too many people can claim to be both first and last simultaneously, but here I am. As you know, all know, we are now a full academy. And I said last night, and I'll say it again, this is a momentous achievement. It recognizes the incredible scientific health policy contributions of you, our esteemed members. Along with these lines, let's congratulate the latest of many Nobel laureates among our ranks, Paul Modrich, who's an NAM member, also an NAS member, but he's been a member of NAM for 12 years, and of course, the Duke faculty. And uh, we're just so happy. He reflects that our members are truly the best and the brightest. And I'm so proud and privileged to be with all of you today. As individuals, your credentials are certainly impressive. But to quote the 19th century poet Sotero, and I quote, individually, we're one drop. Together, we're an ocean, end of quote. Many of you here have experienced this firsthand by coming together through the Institute of Medicine and now the National Academy of Medicine, you've seen your expertise and influence multiplied a thousand times over. Together we can and will continue to improve the health and healthcare in this country and indeed around the world. Now, as the National Academy of Medicine, we can also easily join our forces with our fellow academies of science and engineering. Together, we can more rapidly identify and respond to complex issues that cut across institutions, agencies, disciplines, national and international borders. So becoming a full academy is an accomplishment we should all celebrate. But I'm sure many of you are wondering, what does this reorganization mean as we move forward? Because we had a great session on Sunday, but I think we're going to talk about that again today. And what's in the future for us as the NAM. So today, I'd like to share my vision for the NAM, a vision largely shaped by your input and that of many of our most important stakeholders. And although the transition is still work in progress, to be sure, I ask you to join me in making this vision a reality. And I ask you to be patient as we go through this whole transition. After all, we've been only in existence for three months. Right? We're just born a newborn. And before we talk about the future, let's take a moment to remember how we got here. And we won't be where we are today without IOM and its many pivotal contributions to health and medicine. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge past IOM presidents here with us today. Sam Thier, Ken Schein, Stuart Bondurant, and Harvey Feinberg, so key in building the legacy and success of IOM. So a round of applause for them again. I don't think they'll ever get tired of it. Thank you. As you know, the IOM mission is to adv advise the nation and improve health. Each IOM report begins with a quote from the 18th century German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And you can see the quote here. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. We seek to do more than simply advice. Our aim is to have a positive impact on policy and practice, and, and ultimately to improve human health. So we have a lot to be proud of, because having been the architect of significant progress in policy, care delivery, science, and medicine, the IOM's work informs and improves every aspect 
of health and medicine, both basics research to delivery of care, from improved, from improved treatment to more effective prevention. Our reports guide policy changes in government or organizations, provide evidence on which to base action, and reframe how the world thinks about health problems and solutions. To cite just a few examples, our Quality Chasm series, who's not heard of this, widely credited uh, with having launched the modern patient safety movement and transformed the way we deliver care. It started with the first report to As Human, which was released 15 years ago, and this just last month, we released the latest report in the series, Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare, Diagnostic Errors. I'll come back to that, but that's 15 years of sustained engagement with this really, really important issue. And as I said, it transformed healthcare. Future of Nursing, another one of IOM's most well-known report and influential reports, led to major changes in nursing education, practice, and healthcare delivery. To advance the report's recommendation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the AARP launched a nationwide campaign for action. You'll be pleased to hear that 21 states plus the District of Columbia give full practice authority to nurse practitioners. We're changing the way healthcare is delivered. <laughs> and our reports have resulted in national standards of care serve as basis of almost all federal and state food and nutrition programs and policies, and increased availability of clinical preventive medicine service for women. So, if you look at last year, you should be proud that we continue this impressive trajectory during a time, of course, of major organizational change. You have changed over a president, and you've changed over a new organization. But I think that if you look at this past year, it's been enormously busy for IOM, and of course for myself personally. We weighed in on a remarkable spectrum of issues through 81 consensus reports, workshop summaries, and workshops in brief, some of which you have seen on the screen. As you know, I also embarked on a year-long listening tour across the country. I visited nine cities, many of you hosted it, my visits, and in each location, I had a chance to hear from four major constituent groups. Our members, private sector leaders, community health providers, and the public. The goals of the listening tour were to raise the visibility of IOM, and to expand our network, and to hear about issues that matter to people. Among several things which I heard, which I will discuss later, one issue that consistently arose was the need for us to increase our dissemination impact of our work. And so that's what I want to talk about. In response, my team and I have placed a great emphasis this past year on making sure that our reports are effectively disseminated so they can be translated into tangible impact. We've implemented a process started by my predecessor that each study before it began have a dissemination plan in place so that we're reaching not a large, only a large number of people, but the right people, those who are positioned to take our recommendations and transform into action. Let me give you some examples from this past year. I mentioned earlier that the improving diagnosis in healthcare or diagnostic error. To be sure that messages of this report reach not only clinicians, but also the public, we developed a toolkit for patients and a video you can see here are patient stories that highlight the importance of communication between patients and clinicians in the diagnostic process. This video is really compelling and even featured in the Washington Post. If you've not seen it, I highly encourage you to watch it. In addition, NAM and IOM will commemorate together the 15-year anniversary of TS Human and Quality Chasm Reports as well as explore themes of the latest report on diagnostic error at this year's NAM Rosenthal Symposium, chaired by Ken Shine. It will take place here in December. 
10th here in DC. So we are making sure that this history is known of what we've done and how we continue to move this agenda forward through a different types of media. Last year, I told you about the success of the report in Dying America, end of life care. This March, we held a major summit for health leaders, policymakers, and other stakeholders to discuss how the recommendations from report can be implemented and what barriers exist that might prevent them from becoming reality. The summit had 700 attendees. As a result of the summit, nearly 50 organizations have formally committed in writing to IOM and our A&M committed to action. And those report, and they will come back a year from now in March to talk about where, how things have moved forward. And the report no doubt influenced Medicare's decision to reimburse providers for, one, for time spent counseling patients about end life planning. We have senators, we have CMS, Pat Conway and others all attending, and I think that's really what I call impact. In addition, we are in the process of developing a round table on this issue, so we're not gonna stop here. This is gonna be a new round table on quality of care for people with serious illness. I think I believe that Len Schaefer is gonna chair this, so we can convene stakeholders and decision makers on an ongoing basis on this very important issue. So, because you're all aware that these accomplishments took place where we're undergoing a major uh, transformation and organizational change. This past year will be remembered as the year when we became the National Academy of Medicine. Now this idea of academy dates back to our inception of IOM 45 years ago. And you all know that we have twice attempted to attain academy status without success. Therefore, the formation of the National Academy of Medicine on July 1 is a historic achievement that recognizes the organization's significant contribution to science and medicine, as well as to you, our members. Our time has come. And we must prove to the world that we are deserving of this recognition, and I have no doubt that we are. But how does this creation of Academy change the way we operate? First, it provides us with equal responsibility for the collective oversight of all divisions of the National Research Council, or NRC. In addition, we can elect our own officers, rather than having them be appointed by the NAS president and NAS council. Under the old structure, the IOM was an outlier, as you can see in this slide, because it had both membership and consensus study and convening activities were all housed together. This was a disadvantage <coughs> because IOM did not have an equal role in NRC governance, as you can see, which oversees the divisions and programs of the rest of the academy. And now, of course, as NAM, we do. Let's take a look at the current structure. As you can see, now we are aligned with the other academies and under the umbrella of a more integrated National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So there are three academies, but we now can actually function a seat at the table, if you will, and function much more effectively together. As a condition of reorganization, the programmatic part of the old IOM becomes a new division in the NRC, shown here, which is now rebranded externally as the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, dealing with policies and health of this division. Now, we still are debating what to call this division long run. But because in transition, the name IOM was so strongly associated with rigorous, independent, authoritative studies in response to a very strong desire of our membership and staff to maintain the IOM brand in transition, we decided to retain the name at least for one year. And we are really three months into the transition. We now have discussions about what should we be thinking about going forward. And certainly, I had a small group this morning, and I'll be talking to council and many of you and think about this. Suffice to say, it's our job to make sure 
that we do not forget the great success of IOM, but we need to move on to be a great academy and having the division work closely with us through the new structure. Okay, so did you get all that? Can I call one of you to explain? No problem. <laughs> so if you're confused, I can tell you that even us insiders explain that our complex structure at the National Academy is difficult. So I ask you for your patience, but we'll work through this. I think by next year, things will be very clear because it is said that the concurrent use of both IOM and NAM names has created some confusion to some people. Furthermore, other divisions in the academies do not brand their work independently which raises the question of academy-wide consistency as we begin to be more integrated. And I told you before, and I told you in my letter to you, that these days, you know, we have to work with and deal with the leadership of NAS, NAE, and NLC in many shared decisions, such as this case branding. So I can, I, I'm sure you can imagine there's not always a consensus on every issue we're working hard through this, and what happens in the future of a name division is yet to be determined, but I assure you we're gonna work hard in getting it right. Now, navigating these complex issues while still building a strong and dynamic program portfolio for the NAM, all with a very small team of dedicated staff, has been a challenge. My team and I have been working very hard to ensure a smooth transition there are many internal challenges related to branding, financing, communication, and division of labor. For example, with the exception of the membership office, all other operation functions which were located in the previous IOM have remained with that division. Therefore, in the last few months, we've focused on building the new academy infrastructure that includes recruiting, communication development, and finance administration shops for the NAM. But I do want to stress emphatically here that transition is not about separation. We're working hard to maintain a seamless connection between NAM and the critical work of this division now called IOM and transition. So for example, at the end of August, the senior staff of, of NAM and the IOM division, same family, we participate in a joint offsite retreat. And we have frank discussions, anxiety about what is going to be in the future as we change. And sometimes difficult discussions, conversations, we'll put in long hours asking tough questions. And we did find some time of much needed socialization and bond. Not quite like last night, but we had a good time. In the end, we all agree and committed to ways in which NAM and the new division can support each other's work. And I can assure you that a and and division leadership share an enthusiastic commitment to work together, to our future together. So let's come back to the main question, why does this reorganization matter? Because NAM can have a greater national and international impact. As NAM members, you will have expanded opportunities to work with other academy divisions, as shown here, in new and innovative ways. In case this alphabet soup, you wonder what they are, let me just say, example, this is the Division of Earth and Life Sciences, Division of Engineering Physical Sciences, this is Policy and um, <laughs> Global Affairs, right? <laughs> Gulf Research and Division of uh, Behavior and Education. So now we have a division of health, and, and we get to work across the divisions, of course, for all of you in many different uh, capacity. I want to give you an example of how I think has now become an academy has given us a, added opportunities. The Academy's Wide Human Gene Editing Initiative now underway. This is a really exciting collaboration initiated by NAM and a a NAS response to cutting edge scientific and medical issue. You know, the last council meeting, or actually two council meetings ago, Bob Hallwitz, Keith Yamamoto, 
uh, Mark Fishman came to me and said, this is really an issue you've got to do something about. And Ralph heard the same thing from his members. We got together. And of course, you know what we're talking about, right? The research being done with a powerful new gene editing technology, such as CRISPR-Cas9. These technologies hold great promise for advancing science, treating disease, including potential cures. But they also raise concerns and present ethical, social, regulatory challenges, and particularly because of their um, you know, potential use in gene engineering in human germlines, human embryos. So this is an example of how academies can work together. Ralph and I appointed an advisory committee this summer, chaired by David Baltimore, and you can see many of our NAM members with NAS members working side by side to guide the activities of this initiative. This initiative will include an international summit, which will be held in early December to obtain multinational perspectives of our recent scientific development in human gene editing, and all those issues I told you about, ethical governance across not only discipline, but political boundaries interna internationally. So we have invited the Royal Society of UK and Chinese Academy of Sciences to co-sponsor this event. In addition, we're going to have the participation of 26 different international academies in this really important meeting in December. It's like the Asiloma meeting, except on steroids. Also, in addition, we are going to have a committee co-chaired by Richard Hines and Alter Chero, one of our members, to conduct a comprehensive study of the scientific underpinnings and clinical, ethical, legal, and social implications so that we can make recommendations because Congress is so interested in what should we do about this, this important issue. In fact, Jennifer Doudner, myself, and others appeared before Congress, and they were truly interested about what should happen. So I give you as an example of the opportunity open to the academies. And such rapidly advancing science and medicine make the creation of a National Academy of Medicine especially timely. Because the immense challenges they're shaping today's landscape is phenomenal. Increasing disease burden due to NCDs, aging, rising healthcare costs, and persistent health inequalities. You know, we are really in the perfect position to steer this rapidly evolving health environment towards progress on many fronts. The NAM's independent status with unique interface with academia, government, industry, and civil society provide the platform and resources necessary to impact health both immediately and in the long run in our own nation and beyond. So, to guide us, the NAM has developed a new statement of principles shown here. Leadership, innovation, impact for a healthier future. We stay true to be the advisor of health to a nation and globally for improving health, but we are looking at these guiding principles by which, which encapsulates the way we will determine identify and implement our strategic priorities. Over the last several months, we have worked hard to launch some new initiative that can help us and align with those principles at NAM. If you look at the slide at the bottom, these are the toolkits that we use to advance our principles. Let me give you a sense of what we're doing in the new academy. First, we have launched an exciting program called Innovation to Incubation, led by Kimber Bogart. Eye to eye means to increase the academy's innovative environment and the culture by providing a mechanism for generating new ideas, incubating actionable solutions, and translating forward-thinking concepts into formal programs initiatives. I've been told that we don't do implementation. We don't want to be advocates. However, we can help incubate, accelerate, so that people will come together can take the ideas forward under umbrella to be separately implemented in outside our organization. Another program, Leadership Consortium for Value Science Driven Healthcare, led by Mike McGuinness, is another example of innovative work taking place at the NAM 
by providing a trusted venue for national leaders in health and healthcare to work cooperatively towards the common commitment to effective, innovative care. This group brings together CEOs, FDA, CMS, and the private sector to really engage in learning from each other and advancing, in fact, the uh, healthcare reform. And so, finally, innovation requires us to engage people of diverse generations, cultures, and experiences. The NAM, of course, has now taken in the fellowship program that Marie Mickner runs, and we have several fellowships as you know, that bring diversity of age and experience to academies. But we're exploring new ways to engage younger generation and develop future leaders. Well, for example, we're connecting with local university students through our DC Public Health Case Challenge to promote interdisciplinary problem-based learning around the public health issue that faces the DC community you have the chance to interact with some of these young students, leaders, and hear about their work today at lunch. There's going to be posters, and in fact, there's Building Leadership Luncheon. Hope many of you will attend. I know many of you already signed up to. That's the kind of dynamic organization we need to have. This is why we have all of you, but all of you care about the young, and we are bringing more young people to work with us to really get even greater impact for the future. So as we position NAM to lead, to innovate, and to have impact, we develop three main goals for NAM for the next five years. They are listed here. First, identify and respond to urgent priorities or critical priorities in health and medicine. We need to be ready and prepared to assemble resources and provide guidance when it's most needed. I think the Human Gene Editing Initiative is a very good example of it's timely, we got to do this. We can't wait for outside parties to commission our work. We have to be more proactive and even use our own resources internally to allow us to get going on projects that we need to advise what we identify as most pressing problems. Preparing for, so uh, let me just make sure I go through the rest on this list. Second is to advise the nation and the world on future direction healthcare. I'll talk a little bit about this. And third, as a curator for great ideas and inspire the nation and globally to unite around priorities and big audacious goals on health and medicine. So coming back to the first issue, I talk about gene editing. But think about Ebola. You know, when you think about Ebola and the devastation in West Africa, and of course, impact you know, throughout the globe, and you heard Jim Kim's passion, passion speech yesterday, this epidemic took the lives of more than 10,000 people. The countries most effective have suffered in economic and social losses that would take years to recover from. We know that much of the suffering could have been prevented. We know that it's not a matter of when, not a matter of if, but when the next global health crisis will occur. Question is, how do we get the world leaders to take actions needed to be sure that we better prepare the next time? So this slide shows you that the NAM has launched the Global Health Risk Framework Initiative. And we did this with the encouragement from my good friend Jim Kim last night, from Suzis, and from Margaret Chen, Secretary General of WHO, and from Judith Roden, the president of Rockefeller. And we had the support of seven foundations. Everybody step up and say, you need to organize a multinational, independent, multi-stakeholder commission to respond more effectively and to recommend a global architecture for mitigating the threat of academic infectious disease. So this initiative will build on lessons learned not only from the Ebola outbreak, but from other pandemics to develop a comprehensive framework for improving our response to future global public health issues. So we were very fortunate because the WHO has an interim report 
The UN has a high panel. We've seen as a third report, but one that's independent, comprehensive, non-political, and the support of seven different foundations. This is the International Commission. You know, we want to make this international. We are organizing this under NAM, but as you can see, many of our NAM members, I guess you can see very clear, I will not read the names, are active, acting actively or working actively in this. Such is the opportunity for many of you, our members, to be engaged with these very important initiatives that I believe Academy should take on. This, Acad this commission would develop a comprehensive set of recommendations and propose a preparedness response plan. Now to assure that if you look at the issues that we're looking at here, there are four work streams. We're going to address the issue of governance for global health, under particularly under this emergency situations, financing for pandemic and other outbreaks, health system strengthening, and of course, research and development, uh, in particularly in R&D, in medical products, vaccines, and others. To assure this framework will have an impact on future pandemic preparedness responsiveness, we're working sh to ensure that our report gets considered and we already are on the sum of the agenda by key decision makers such as G7 and the World Health Assembly. That's the kind of impact we want to have. Our second goal is to advise this nation and the world on the future directions of health and healthcare. Here in the US, we're a little bit over a year away from electing a new president and new administration. And now that the Affordable Care Act has been enacted, we must thoughtfully consider the gaps that still exist and the key areas that still need to be addressed where nonpartisan, evidence-based advice can bring about positive change. Mark McLaren and I, uh, Mark is a member of NAM, are co-chairing this new initiative called Vital Directions for Health and Healthcare to envision and recommend the future of healthcare. Once again, the steering committee and some of the people are in this room, you can see the names, includes experts from a variety of disciplines, including many of our eminent NAM members and former politicians and government leaders. And we will produce a series of publications, symposia, and a synthesis document that will offer a conceptual framework to identify areas of opportunities and explore national policies that are immediately actionable that should assist the next government's plan for improving healthcare and health. That's how exciting it is. I'm also excited to announce, as we've shown in this slide here, that we just received a very generous $10 million gift from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to establish a multi-year culture of health program. The goals are to identify conditions and solutions needed for all achievable, equitable, good health and well-being, and to examine the policies and practices needed to support culture that promotes health. This grant will establish an endowment and support project activities, including working with IOM consensus studies related to this program. The first consensus study done by IOM is, in fact, on health disparities in the United States and, of course, identify community-based solutions. The third goal is to serve as a curator for big ideas and inspire our entire community to unite around shared priorities and big and even audacious goals on health and medicine. You know, these days, my observation is most people in health and medicine are hunkered down and operate in silos that focus narrowly on their own problems. The world needs aspirational and audacious goals to inspire confidence that we can do more, much more, to change the course of health. Many of us believe that major breakthroughs can be achieved through partnerships of the best minds across all sectors, sharing common vision and goals, working collectively to address big, bold problems, creating the right environment with robust resources and aligning incentive and value. That's why we have initiated our grand challenges in health and medicine. 
chair by our member Bob Horowitz, and you can see it includes other council members. Now this initiative, unlike the other, is still a little bit early in the formative stage, because we want to make sure that we are being thoughtful about what those challenges and how the process by which they develop. We see this as a long-term NAM initiative involving several phases. First phase is the recognition, identification of the most pressing challenge area through a transparent process that seeks input from many perspectives. You know, globally, the G7 has identified antimicrobial resistance as the one to take on, as is UK. We can think about what is the big thing we can be driving. Last night, Jim Kim challenged us to address three areas where the academy can have a profound and lasting impact. His words. There's security, equity, and delivery. We should think about that. And today's meeting, the focus on the annual meeting is aging, another really important topic. I think these are the potential grand challenges that we should think about as we consider them and finalize them through a very deliberate process. The second phase, we hope to catalyze action. Catalyze action towards solution by stewarding collective strategy from multiple stakeholders in policy, business, philanthropy, academia, and the general public. I believe that the Grand Challenge will inspire big, bold thinking and actions through public and private partnerships to change the cost of health. As you can imagine, it will take resources to make this organization dynamic, more better able to respond to these timely issues. And in the past, we have relied heavily on internal resources, but ours is limited. We're going to have to need more external support as we move forward. So in this year, next year, my intention is to focus some of my efforts on increasing our development activities, and I'll need your help. So as we look towards our very exciting future, I still say, and we must remember, to remain connected to our past. NAM and our members must continue to work closely with a new division, the IOM division, on reports and programmatic activities. I'm sure you noticed just now how integral division is to just about everything, initiatives I talked about uh, that I just discussed at the NAM. From Global Health Risk Framework, where the fundamental work in workshops and writing are done by IOM staffers, even though the initiative resides in NAM, to gene editing, where it involves several divisions across the academy to work on this, even though it started with NAS and NAM, to our fellowships, where we continue to integrate, of course, the work of division and staff and the experience of our fellows. Connection between NAM and the division is strong and never been stronger, and grow, even grows stronger in the future. So although our organization is changing, our common purpose remains the same. So in summary, I believe that as an academy, we're in a better position now to leverage our resources, increase our impact, respond more quickly to urgent issues. The future is very, very bright indeed. I'd like to conclude by stating the obvious. This has been quite a year for all of us. We become a full-fledged academy. It's a year of big accomplishment, big challenges, and big adjustments. A year of meaningful impact and bold plans for the future. Now, none of this will be possible without your unwavering support and dedication. As said earlier, when I began my presidency a year ago, I embarked on a year-long listening tour across the country. So many of you, you, our members, community health workers, private sector, public sector, they all came forward to share their ideas, all of which have the same great I values, and they greatly inform and shape our vision for the National Academy of Medicine. Leadership, innovation, and impact. So let's keep this conversation going. Your input has always been and will always be essential to our success. I hope you attend one of many of our regional gatherings in the future. 
and share your views there. But I don't want you to wait for a meeting. You can always share ideas with me or my staff. You can submit feedback, as you know, through our website, send me an email directly. And finally, in addition to our bi-monthly letter, which provides you an overview of updates and activities. As you know, I've started a monthly letter directly talking to you about what's going on, what my challenges are, to keep you updated, in fact, on what's going on at IOM from my vantage point. I even started a blog to the staff. And we even have selfies on the blog. You should visit it sometime. <laughs> so I want to hear from you. And we'll do our best to keep you informed and the major initiatives as we progress. So this reorganization has made us more capable than ever before of bringing about the real change. We have a tremendous amount of work ahead of us, but with your support, I know it can be done. Remember the African proverb, you want to go fast, go alone. Want to go far, go together. Together we'll go far. We'll change the course of health and achieve our mission of improving health and well-being everywhere. It's a privilege to serve you as your president. Thank you. Thank you. And so today's program will be webcast live and can be accessed, ac accessed in our new website, nam.edu. In addition, the meeting is being live tweeted on Twitter for those who use them using hashtag N-A-M-M-T-G-2015. You got it? <laughs> Thank you. Now, today's program, I think, is going to be so exciting. It, the topic, as you know, is aging. And we are going to drift into longevity also. As some of you already know, the Academy has, this forum, has also a forum on aging, disability, independence. And several members of that roundtable and forum are also here. So the goal of this forum is to offer, foster dialogue and address issues of interest and concern related to aging disability. And so, of course, these communities have many priorities in common, such as maximizing independence and supporting community living. Jack Rowe and, uh, Jen Jett and Alan Jetty are the co-chairs who got this forum up and running. Baton has been passed now to co-chairs Terry Fulmer and uh, Fernando Torres Gill. It's exciting to see a diversity of sponsors who have come together to support this activity, and I'd like to thank them. But also, for today's program, I'd like to thank the program committee. They put an enormous amount of effort into organizing this program. And the program committee members include uh, El Reese, the chair, Nancy Adler, and Gil Oman, with the expert participation of Dan Blazer, Carol Grinder, Eric Larson, and the staff support from Lauren Schoen and Clyde Benny. Please join me in recognizing their tremendous work in organizing this program. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm really, really paying attention to this meeting. <laughs> but don't forget, I said last night, isn't it great to be young all over again as a new academy? I'd like to invite to the podium the chair of the planning committee, El Reese, and who will introduce the program our keynote speaker. Al Rees is the Vice President for Medical Affairs at the University of Maryland and the John Z and the Kiko K. Bowers Distinguished Professor and Dean at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He's a member of the NAM Council. He's done a great job organizing this. Please join me in welcoming Al. <laughs> 